Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 183 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at the charge point operator, BP Pulse. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to remind you that if you have a few moments, pop on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, drop a quick review for the show. It'll help in search engine voodoo, and my sponsors will be eternally grateful, as will I. Our main topic of discussion today is BP Pulse. You remember last season we chatted with Ian Johnston from Osprey Charging. And at the end of the season before, we chatted with James McKemmy, Tom Hurst, and Dee Humphreys from Fastned, Podpoint, and GeniePoint. Well, there are a number of other CPOs I want to get on the podcast. We've spoken with Adrian Keane from Instavault a couple of weeks back. And the three major ones that are left are MFG, Shell, and BP Pulse. Now, I've been in contact with MFG, who said they want to devote their time to rolling out great infrastructure rather than talking about rolling out great infrastructure. So that leaves Shell and BP Pulse. Now, we did speak with Tom Callow from BP Pulse way back in season two, I think. At the time, this was a network that still had a good reputation, cheap pricing, and it was called Chargemaster or Polar at the time. Since then, it's been bought out by BP. It has expanded. Uh, It's pulled out of the home charging market, concentrating instead on public charging with either AC DC or ultra rapid charging. So I'm happy to say that today we do have BP Pulse on the show and I'm delighted to welcome Daniel McLaren to the EV Musings podcast. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Glad to have you here. Can I, uh, can I start the way I start every inter- interview and that's by asking, what's your EV origin story? What got you into electric vehicles? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so it probably starts about Six, seven years ago. So I was a, a, a product trainer for, for an OEM. Um, so we did lots of training. It wasn't just on the vehicles. It was you know, anything to do with any role within a car dealership effectively. Um, but within that, we did a lot of product launches over the years. And um, it was actually the ID3 was my first EV product launch. Um, it was in Germany. And I don't know. So I'll, I'll be really honest with you. I'm dyslexic, my, my, my education background. So I've always sort of struggled with education. And I don't know why but EV sticks. Um, and I have this unbelievably weird ability to reel off charging capacity for any EV out there and things like that. And it just, I loved it. So um, during lockdown, an opportunity come up with BP to run the EV center in Milton Keynes. It was EV experience center. Um, so I, I went and run that for nine months. And um, at the end of it, I was very fortunate that uh, BP asked me to stick around and, and I'm running EV education today. Uh, I mean, the EV experience said to love that. That's the place I went to try the car that was the very first one that I actually bought or at least the Kia Soul. So I love that whole. Yeah, it was a very nice place to be fair. It was. Uh, just one random question here. Do you know off the top of your head how many people who work in the senior management team at BP Pulse actually drive electric? Is it all of them? Um, I, I would say the majority, yes, um, from there. We we have various offices around the country. You know, we've got a lot of people who work in around London who just don't drive in general um, because in London you don't. But I would say for the majority um, who work for my Milton Keynes office, yeah, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about the company itself. Now, obviously, it was formed when BP purchased ChargeMaster a couple of years ago. Now, BP Pulse were acknowledged as the if not the largest, definitely one of the largest overall networks. So do you have some stats about the network itself? Number of chargers split between AC and DC, number of charging sessions, that sort of stuff? Yeah, sure. So um, on the whole now, we have just over 8,000 chargers. Um, and to sort of break that down a little bit for you, um, it, we're just over 3,000 from a rapid and ultra-fast perspective. So um, yeah, one of the largest um, out there. From our business as a whole in the UK, we have around 300 people now that work within that organization. We're a global business as well. So we're in multiple different countries around the world um, from an EV charging standpoint. Um, but in our network in the UK, um, 40% of our network is made up of our rapid and ultra fast um, network from there. And sort of 70% of the energy that's delivered comes from that that DC network as well. Um, so yeah, we're pretty large um, and we're still growing very, very quickly. 
And on a typical day, week, or month, how many separate charging sessions would uh, would be initiated through the network? So I wouldn't necessarily have that number um, to date. What we would look at is sort of utilization of, of, of our hubs and sites along the way. So we look at places like our new hub in Kettering is one of our most heavily utilized sites. Um, and then some of our hubs around sort of York area as well. Um, and as I said before, sort of 40, sorry, 70% of our uh, energy we sell will come from um, those hubs. Now, I believe you've installed, am I right in thinking it's something near to 250 DC charges already this year? And you're, I think you recently went ahead of Instavolt as the largest charge point operator with a uh, DC network in the UK. The charges you've put in have tended to be more hub based rather than some of the old style of of single units. Talk, Talk me through the the rationale behind that, the thinking on, on that strategy? Sure, absolutely. So yeah, our, our focus at the minute is is ultra-fast um, hubs and the rollout of that. And we showed a commitment to that last year. We invested a billion pound um, in the UK infrastructure. Um, and yeah, absolutely. We've opened up hubs recently in Kettering. So that's got 10, 300 kilowatt units there. Um, we've just opened one in Hull. Where it's got sort of 12, 150 kilowatt units. We've got one of the largest EV hubs in Europe being launched very soon um, in Birmingham, NEC, that's got 16, 300 kilowatt units. So 32 cars at 150 has the ability, but it also has 157 kilowatt units as well for anyone sort of attending uh, the NEC for a show. So look, absolutely, we're focusing on hubs. We believe um, that is what customers want and, and, and they need. But more importantly with our hubs, it's making sure they're in the right places. So for me, Customers don't want to detour miles off of their route to, to go and find this. They need the right speed charging in the right place. And that's really what we're focusing on uh, when we look at the locations of our hubs as well. Well, let, let's build on that a little bit. I want to talk about locations because, you know, if I go back in time, traditionally, uh, the BP Pulse single units were installed. Well, they were charge master then, obviously, for, for a vast majority of them. They were installed in places such as uh, holiday and car parks and similar places like that. And a few years ago, you moved to installing some of the higher powered double, triple or quadruple units at some of your uh, franchise BP fuel stations. So a couple of questions that arise from that. Uh, given the explosive rate at which EVs are being purchased, is there any rationale behind keeping some of the single units at the back of a hotel car park? Is that the right solution, for example? Absolutely. We're certainly not in the game of just trying to take away charges because we want hubs. Um, we have a huge network team who split themselves across all of our functions. So we have people who will look after just forecourts on their own. We'll have people look after hubs and people will look after our contracts with um, hotel chains. So for us, it's just making sure, you know, if the charger is being used all the time um, and it is in a place that is convenient for customers. And we absolutely want to keep that. Um, we're not saying we're just going to purely build hubs and not worry about anything else. We we have on our um, teams now, we have 40 field service engineers who are out there every day um, maintaining our network. And those hotel um, chargers in sort of that 50 kilowatt units at the back of a car park, um, it may not seem like it's the best location, but some of them are really heavily utilized and really needed. So absolutely, it's, it's still part of our plans. We still work with not just hotel chains, but restaurant chains as well, to make sure we're installing their charges for their customers. Just picking up on something you said a few months ago about rolling out the the hubs, uh, what's a typical ideal location for one of the hubs? Yeah, there's there's been a bit of a land uh, a land grab recently <laughs> with uh, a lot of the charge point operators, and you've come up with with a couple of really good ones, as you say, there, Kettering and and the NEC. So. How how are you going about getting the land that you want and identifying the the appropriate location to put one of the larger hubs in? Um, so not to sound like other CPOs have been on your podcast, uh, I think sort of the first thing you always look at is sort of EV adoption in the area. You know, we want to make sure if we're going to build these wonderful hubs that um, it's in the right place for people. So you want to make sure that the hubs are in a location that's going to be used. So you've got heavy traffic footfall going through it, so to speak. Then power's the big one. It's okay building hubs, but if you don't have the power for the right speed charging, then it's, it, it doesn't work for you. The last thing we want to do is um, build hubs, but we're, we're limited on power. So people are turning up and they're in a destination that maybe doesn't have convenience and they're there for an hour because we've only got 50 kilowatt units there. So we really focus on making sure, as I mentioned earlier, 
it's the right power in the right places for the right vehicles because we need to future proof don't we at the end of the day cars are charging quicker nowadays you know look at some of the cars now um they're taking upwards of sort of 280 kilowatts so we're really focused on making sure we're future proofing our hubs as well so having the right speed chargers so at the moment 300 kilowatt chargers go in so we have that ability as i say we just want to make sure it's the right charger in the right place now i know whenever any charge point operator puts out a tweet or something on social media announcing the opening of a new charger or a hub there's always the responses of well it's all well and good putting chargers there but when are you coming to Wales slash Cornwall slash Lincolnshire slash fill in the blanks? How do you respond to those kind of um, comments? Because they're valid, but in the context of what you just said about the right charger in the right place, it's it's a balance that you've got to to try and and, and deal with. So how, how do you respond to people who who say things like that? Um, I think you've done a very good job of answering it there. It's, it's the balance, isn't it? Um, so when we look at sort of anywhere in the country now, so any of the sort of sparser locations, um, generally the sparse locations, if you were to look at the EV adoption rate, it would be very small in that area. So um, we're like all of the other charge point operators. Of course, we want to cover the breadth and depth of the country in there. But what I will say is we'd already do a pretty good job of it. 70% of mainland UK within five miles of a BP Pulse rapid and ultra rapid charger. So we are already in a lot of places. Do we need to start to progress further into sort of more minute, minute areas? Like so you say, summer Wales is quite sparse or or down south in Cornwall and up north of um, the England plus Scotland. Absolutely, we do. Um, but what I would always say to people is, I think there's always that added joke is of an EV driver. You never notice a charger's there till you start driving an EV. And I think that's absolutely the case in, in most of situations with us, as I say, with 70% of people being pretty close to our charges already. Now, you mentioned there that one of the reasons you don't put charges in in certain places is because EV uptake is, is relatively uh, low in some of those areas. And that's, that's a perfectly valid comment. But there's also the flip side of that, which is, well, if you build it, they will come. So uh, at what point are you going to turn around and say, right, we've got an area here, I'll take you know where my parents live, sort of up around uh, the M62 Yorkshire Lancashire border. There's very, very, very little there. Uh, generally, not just BP Pulse, but generally in terms of of charges, there are one or two good ones. But if if you build it there, you will get a lot higher uptake in places like that. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely, completely agree. What I would sort of add as a caveat to it is. Um as a business, as this EV industry, as we're growing and as all the CPOs grow, and we're all in a very similar boat in as much as, as you can imagine, to put these hubs in is hugely costly, okay? And when we put these um, hubs in, what we have to focus about is making sure they're they're used to to gain back the, the revenue from that. So um, as you can imagine, to put a hub in somewhere that perhaps isn't going to be used in the next two or three years doesn't really make too much commercial sense. But at the same time, we absolutely agree that we need to broaden the market. And what I would always say is, and again, I don't mean to keep coming back to what we are doing, but if we look at sort of BP4 courts generally in the UK, we're on 136 now, and BP4 courts are everywhere on that. So we are doing it. But what I'd say is, do we need to do more? Of course you do. All of us need to do more, and we need to get charges out there faster as EV adoption grows. What I would say is, we are we are all doing it, and it will all, all be in good time. You mentioned the four course there, which brings me very nicely onto my next uh, topic. Shell Recharge, one of your competitors, opened the charging hub in Fulham, where they took an existing for, um, petrol forecourt, ripped all the tanks and the pumps out, replaced it all with chargers. Fantastic site. I was the first paying customer to actually charge there on the day it opened. Is, there, is that something that BP Pulse would consider doing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we have a strategy for our four courts. Four courts do have their challenges along the way, um, and I'm sure Shell will come into them that um, these four courts were never built for EV charging initially. The fact that we're, we're already on 136 of ours um, is great. And look, do we have an ambition to convert them over a period of time? Yes, we do. But we've got to do them in the right way. There's a lot of legislation around having charges on four courts and, and having certain space between pumps and charger. We've we've got some um, on our four courts, 150 kilowatt units, where we've had to put substations in, um, and that takes up space on four courts. So we have to plan for the future for that. At the moment, we have a particular charger that's battery integrated. We can install on four courts, so we're able to install a lot quicker on, on, on our four courts as well. So yes, we have a strategy, um, but at the same time, it's making sure we... Where we can, we're still putting charges on there on the sites that are still going to remain um, wet fuels for the time being. 
Is that actually the answer to the question that I asked? Are you looking specifically at ripping out complete forecourts, replacing all the petrol pumps with chargers? Yes, there is a strategy um, for us to go and do that on there. I'm not going to sit here today and give you timescales um, on, on that. Um, but yes, there is an absolute strategy. For us as a business, you've got to imagine, we have land with convenience already offered there, so um, food and drinks and toilets on site. So we'd be silly not to have a strategy of converting that as we move towards sort of net zero in 2050. So yeah, we will absolutely do that in the near future. Without making any public commitment to anything, is that in progress anywhere or is it still planning? I can't give you specifics today on on where we are with it. Um, w- what I can tell you is we are doing it. It is going to happen, um, but I'm just, I can't give you timescales on that. Uh, let's move on to charger design and setup of an actual location. If we step back and look at some of the earlier charge master chargers, such as the one at, oh, I don't know, Audley's Wood Hotel in Basingstoke, which is one that I've used. <laughs> Um, it's by itself in a separate, unlit car park away from the main hotel, as is the Holiday Inn in Farnborough and any number of other single installed hotels in pub car parks. And what, what makes it worse is that there are rarely separate lighting areas covering them. And there, they are potential problem spots for vulnerable drivers. And th- this is not a BP Pulse issue. This is, the, there are quite a few charge point operators that fall into that category. You're probably aware the charge save initiative that's aiming at evaluating public charges against a 100 plus point safety and accessibility questionnaire uh, to help people see which charges are going to be the best for them to use if they're say a vulnerable person or wheelchair bound now i've done work in the past with charge safe for a pilot uh, i've evaluated bp pulse units and very very few of them especially single units fared very well or fared well at all. Does, does that concern you? Absolutely. So we have, we absolutely understand that from a accessibility standpoint, um, we, we, we need to do more. Um, and any of our new hubs rolling out, we're absolutely doing that as well. So um, Kettering has an accessibility bay, Birmingham NEC will, will have a couple. And look, we are absolutely focused on making sure accessibility is a big thing and, it, and all of our charges are. Now, one of the things we did do is actually last year, we run a customer forum and we invited 10 to 15 customers who use our network. And one of those was a wheelchair user. And we've worked with him over the past year to, to sort of understand it through his eyes a, a lot more. And that's been invaluable for us. And yeah, absolutely, we need to focus on making sure that our charges are accessible by everyone. Now, as we mentioned earlier, we have a lot of charges out there. Um, just from the rapid and ultra rapid, we, we, we have 3,000 out there. So do we need to do more on all of them? Yes, absolutely we do. But we're, as I say, we're, we're incredibly focused on making sure that we work through that and we make sure all of our network um, is accessible for everyone. Does these things take time? Absolutely, they do. But what I can promise you is it is a priority for us. Do you, and when I say you, I mean the BP Pulse organization, design and install all your own charges or is there an amount of work that gets subcontracted out? So um, we do install um, our own charges. We we do a lot of work with a company called EVN um, who have built our Kettering hub. They've built our um, NEC hub and they've done one for us in Mansfield and Tamworth, I believe, as well along the way. So, But we work with them in making sure that it's fitting the needs of of what we need for our customers on that. So they they will do a lot of our installs from a hub perspective um, and as I say, our recent sort of at Kettering and NEC having the accessible bays, having lower screens on the chargers. Um, they'll work with us on that. I ran a poll recently on Twitter, which as we know is highly scientific, uh, <laughs> asking whether charge point operators should display the actual power being provided to a site. So for example, four 150 kilowatt chargers at a site with just a 500 kilowatt supply will give a different performance than three 150 kilowatt chargers at the same site. Now, there's been at, well, at least one charge point operator that we both know that's done a series of upgrades, installed multiple high power units at each location, but for various reasons has had to limit the power going to the charges. And as a result, their 150 kilowatt units are capped at 60 kilowatts. Is a notice showing actual su- power supply to a location, not a unit, a good idea? Um, I can't comment on on other CPOs and, and how they set up their charges. Um, what I can tell you is that our hubs, um, 
if you've got a 150 kilowatt charger, you will get 150 kilowatts if your car can take it. Um, and we've proved that. We at Kettering, we had the EV rally come through for an EV checkpoint. We had 70 cars come through. So all 20 bays were in use and the chargers were working at their full capacity from there. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, power is a premium in some places. So I understand at some sites, some people may, may need to sort of restrict it. Um, but we certainly don't advertise sites that have less power, so to speak. And, and to the point, we have a couple of nice surprises along the way. So recently, I was on one of our four courts in Newport, South Wales, and advertised 150 kilowatt charger. But because I had an, a, an 800 volt EV, I was drawing 175 from it. So it's quite a nice surprise for me from there. But yeah, absolutely. We, we, we don't um, advertise what we can't deliver. There's different aspects to that. Like, for example, I'm on that map at the moment. I'm looking at a 150 kilowatt charger close to where I am. And the comment is only charging at 35 kilowatts. Now, we'll talk about price in a moment, but what are your thoughts on people paying a premium for higher power charging, but for whatever reason, not getting the advertised charging speeds? Yeah, absolutely. So look, we're not um, looking to sort of except having charges that I don't know may, may have power issues and, and people are paying a premium for it. And, and that's what I said earlier. We over the last two years, we've really been focused on making sure our network is what it said it is. And what I mean by that is you get the power you want from it or you can get from it. And it's reliable as well on there. So we have 40 field service engineers that are out there making sure we're doing that. But of course we we're not we we don't want our customers to come to a site, um, have a charger that's got an issue with it and they're only getting 35 kilowatts and they're paying the premium price. What I would all caveat to that is, is obviously every, every EV is slightly different as well. So, you know, we've had people in the past, my wife, for example, drives a particular EV that's got a 70 kilowatt limit on her charger. That's effectively what she could take. So if she goes and uses a public charger that's 150, she's only going to get that. Now that comes down to education. Uh, and I think we all, and, and, and us included as a charge point operator, need to do some education around EVs. What would stop them getting? the max speed that's sort of presented by the charger. And then at the same time, making sure our chargers are working. So the customers have confidence that when they turn up at our charger, that if their car can take, they're going to get that desired speed. We're absolutely not in the industry of, of wanting people to pay a premium to use an ultra fast charger, but not get that ultra fast speed. Let's talk pricing. Yes. Uh, now, in my experience, BP Pulse were traditionally one of the first to increase prices. Now, I went from paying 14 pence a kilowatt hour with a subscription back in 2018 to a point where the top price is now, I think it was 79 pence a kilowatt hour without subscription. And the basic subscription price is not a huge amount lower than that, although it is lower. You're also the only network that has three different prices for the same kilowatt hour of electricity on each type of charger, depending whether it's subscription, contactless, or pay as you go through the app. So, two questions: Why so complicated? Um, so, I, I would I would say our pricing structure um, isn't too complicated. Um, from there, we have a contactless payment. Um, we have a subscription rate. What I would say with pricing is we have a dedicated team to focus on pricing to make sure we are competitive, to make sure our customers are getting good value for money on our sites. From there, um, and our subscription model. Just to come back to a point you made earlier, our subscription model is twenty percent less. Than, mm -hmm. than the contactless price. Um, so what I would say is I, I think our subscription model is is awesome value for money um, on there. And if you're a customer that uses um, the public network regularly, as I mentioned earlier, 70% of mainland UK are within five mile of one of our rapid or ultra rapid. So they can get really affordable pricing um, from our subscription model. So I wouldn't say it's too complicated. I would say we have a fantastic um, offer from a subscription service. And I do think we are competitive from a pay-as-you-go service as well. So the follow-up question to that is, as far as that pricing methodology is, is concerned, are you looking to penalise ad hoc charges and push people more towards subscription? Is, is that the methodology behind that? Oh, absolutely not. No, we're, we're not here to penalise. And, and, and as I had said, we, our, our team of um, individuals who work on our, our pricing, we're looking at across platform of, of who are our competition, what are they charging, and make sure we're offering good value for money. And I think we're competitive in that market. Not to sound like the CPOs who you had on before, you know, we, we all have agreements with, with energy providers and we all have certain rates that we're paying. And, and I think we do a good job of, of ma maintaining a value for money rate. 
But our subscription model, um, I think, is very appealing for people because, as I not to see <laughs> banging the drum, but um, with, with us having such a large network, it's not like you're you're paying a subscription model and limiting yourself to not having a charge in it you, where most people can. So I'll ask you the same question I've asked all the charge point operators that have come on here, which is, does your company make a profit on EV charging at the moment? I won't go down our commercial route uh, of how we set up. Um, what, what I will say is, um, look, we're all, as all CPOs out here, we all want to install um, super fast charging in reliable places for people. Um, and that does come at a cost. We are a business at the end of the day, like all commercial operators. So we set our pricing accordingly, but at the same time, we're not here to overprice. We are here to make it competitive, but make sure we can still deliver on our promises of sort of increasing our network. All right. Let's talk about a couple of potential pricing uh, initiatives that might come up. Where are you on overstay fees? So on a couple of our sites, we we do. Um, It seems to be predominantly sort of the hotel chains uh, and sort of they have a, a 90 minute overstay penalty. And I believe it's ten pound um, on on those sites. Look, it's something we constantly monitor. The last thing we want to do is start charging people for being along because I think me and you had a conversation about this before offline. That you know, every car charges at different speed. We've got um, modern cars now who are charging super quick, and they get to eighty percent very quickly. Um, and we have sort of old to sort of quote, you've got some Nissan Leafs that may take a lot longer. So when we talk about overstay penalties, for me, it's not necessarily the period of time, but it's it, it's how we can integrate sort of. The, the level of the battery on there. We, I know we have this EV etiquette rule of you know eighty percent move on this slows down. But again, as EVs evolve, um, the cars are going to charge quicker. They're going to charge higher for longer. So we need to constantly evolve with that as well. And it, it can't just be a one rule of thumb of um, you overstay an hour and you get a penalty because there's some people who are driving older EVs who really need every last kilowatt hour from that and their car may take more so yes we have it in place but i think it's something we need to monitor to make sure again our customers are getting a good experience from it and that comes down to education well absolutely and i think there's two aspects to overstay fee there's the one that you've just mentioned there which is yeah they're charging slowly they're there for a long time but the other aspect is they plug the car in it's a rapid it's a fast charging car it's been there 20 25 minutes it's hit 100 percent, and the the car is still even though it's no longer charging, it's on the charger. There's nobody nearby to move it. So it's effectively blocking a charger, which is bad for your business because you've got a charger that's out of, uh, effectively out of commission. And it's bad for EV users who are seeing uh, a charger that's, that's there, it's available, but they can't access it. So what about some mechanism for, I, I, I've got to use the word penalize, but I'm not sure I necessarily mean for charging somebody who is in that situation. They've, they've, blocks the charger effectively. Sure, absolutely. So look, that, that, that is the case I, th- I think we all need to focus on, isn't it, is to make sure that um, people who are sat there on 100% on a rapid charger, they are the ones that could incur overstay penalties. Now, that's easier to control in some places th- than others, you know, on our particular uh, hubs. Yeah, absolutely. We, we could do if need be, sort of bring that into case. Um, in some cases in hotel chains, it may be that um, although we maintain it that they operate the sort of ruling of that car park. So we have to work with them on there. And and what we don't really want to end up here, I suppose, with is multiple different rules for multiple different places. I'm a massive believer is we need to make EV driving simple and easy. And sort of, and again, I suppose this is where Charge UK will come into it is make sure we're all working off the same hymn sheet. And that's something that maybe we could look at in the future of, of all sort of agreeing a, a flat line of where we stand on this sort of issue. I do want to talk about Charge UK in a bit. It, that's later on in my... Uh Topics of conversation, but <laughs> sure. um, from a from a pricing point of view, spot pricing. So take the wholesale electricity price at the time the customer plugs in, add some sort of a markup to cover your overheads, either percentage or fix, and then use that to charge the customer. Is that something you consider? Again, it's not something we're doing at, at the minute, but it's something we will continue to monitor and, and look at. And when if we feel if we feel it is the right thing to to bring in, we absolutely will do. But for the minute sort of how we're approaching charging uh, and, and pricing, uh, we, we feel is the right way for us to go about it for the time being. I want to talk about motorway service areas. Now, a big issue recently has arisen with charging at motorway service areas. Obviously, GridServe have taken over 
and upgraded more or less all the old Ecotricity offerings, and that's great news. There does seem to be some sort of contention between Gridserve and Welcome Break, who seem to want to do their own thing. Then there was the CMA ruling, which shortened down the Gridserve uh, monopoly by quite a few years. Now, we're already seeing uh, BP Pulse putting charges in at some of the forecourts at some motorway service areas. Paint me a picture of the vision for MSAs in the next few years. What are your plans? So, yeah, firstly, we absolutely want to be involved as an EV driver. Motorway service charging is is what what, what you what we want and need, isn't it? At the end of the day, if we're going on a long journey, like I will be next week, um, I want convenient charging. So, but as you say, we are already involved in that space already. Off the top of my head, I'm thinking we've got Reading East and West bound. We have Stratford on the M6. We've got Scotland Heart Hill. So we are already on there. But again, we're always looking at the opportunities on sort of in and around motorways. I say not just motorway service stations, but but landing around it. But again, that sort of area, if we're going to install on a motorway service station or, or within that vicinity, power's got to be right. Uh, the last thing we want to do is install chargers, but we don't have the power capability and we're, we're not delivering the right service. If we are on a motorway service station, you want ultra-fast chargers. Um, you want the ability of charging your car very quickly. So we will certainly not just install for the sake of it, but we will absolutely look at any opportunity that comes up. And things evolve as well, especially on forecourts. Like we always say now, we're on 136 forecourts. We've looked at every one of our forecourts. What can have charging, what can't have charging. And the ones that at the time we say we can't have charging, for whatever that reason may be, it might be that we couldn't get power there at the right time or we had an issue getting a certain cable, we will constantly review that and go back because things change. So we're constantly looking at all of our sites on, on motorways of, can we? What would it look like to have it there? Because again, we need to make sure from the charges we're putting on four courts, are we going to hit all the res- restrictions we need to? Are we going to be able to put a substation in? We can't put a substation in. Do we have to go down the, the battery integrated route? What may not suit a motorway service station if we've got huge amounts of vehicles going through there. So there's lots of little bits and pieces that we need to sort of piece together. But on the whole, absolutely want to be involved in that space. Of course we do. Um, and we will continue to pursue it. Well, you're in an enviable position, as you said, because it's, I don't know what the exact figure is, but let's say, you know, between a third and a half of all motorway service areas in the country have a BP4 court on them. So if the power is right, then you've got all the the real estate that you need to be able to put those charges in. But the two questions that arise from that are, what are you going to do about those places where you don't have a forecourt presence on the motorway service areas? Would you be looking at doing something similar to what the current incumbents do and putting, providing the powers there and putting in a bank of charges actually at the um, at the actual services itself rather than at the forecourt? And the the sort of follow-on question to that is for the ones where you do have the locations, is having a rapid charger at a forecourt, which is not necessarily convenient for somebody who wants to stop at the motorway services, but is convenient for someone who's currently stopping for petrol, is that the right model? Does that make sense? It does to a degree, I think. <laughs> um, what I'd say is from, from from a motorway strategy, where we would install chargers, whether they'd be on a forecourt or actually within the, the physical motorway itself is, what I'd say is nothing's off the table and we will always explore every option. Because as I said, it is... It is the space pe- people want to be in, isn't it? Um, because it's it's in the most convenient places. So we'll look at everything and um, whether that's we have to install on our forecourt or whether there is an option maybe in the future to um, install actually within the, the service area. We'll look at that. But again, we want to make sure that it is convenient for people. So um, when they are charging on Ultrafast, do they have accessibility to toilets, to, to food and drink, whether that's through our forecourt or elsewhere? So um, I know it's not on a motorway, but Kettering, for example, we like the Kettering hub. We have a um, a convenience store right next to it. So when customers are charging, they've got an opportunity to to go to the toilet or, or get, a, get a drink as well. So that's a big part to it as well, because to bring people to charging, yes, you want super fast um, speed, but also you, you do want a convenience offering for people as well. I think it's come to the point where we need to address the elephant in the room, which is reliability. Now, four years ago when I started, well, five years ago when I started driving EVs, BP Pulse were my go-to network. They were convenient, cheap, well-located, and they worked. And I could count the number of failed BP Pulse chargers on the fingers of a mitten. Now, however, 
do regularly appear near the bottom of customer satisfaction surveys from companies such as ZapMap and WhatCar, et cetera. And usually you're held off the absolute bottom by the other network that you own, which is Charge Your Car. So I have a number of questions related to this. Firstly, what are your thoughts on customer survey rankings? Look, absolutely. We, we, we want to be as uh, sort of as thought of as highly as possible. Now, look, let, let's address that elephant in the room you spoke about earlier, Gary. You know, ha- mm-hmm. Do we sit here and say we've had reliability issues in the past? Absolutely, we do. We, we, we own that. Um, what I would say is over the past 18 months, we've done incredible jobs to take our network from a reliability that was in the 70 percentile to the mid 90s now. We've gone from a 1.3 on Trustpilot to a 4.3. So our network has dramatically improved from there. I think sometimes where the reputation comes from is perhaps previous use and then not used us in recent times. And look, we absolutely understand in the past that someone may have not had a good experience. What we can do now is make sure we're delivering a really good, reliable charger at our hubs. And and from that, from looking at our reliability of our network, from looking at things like Trustpilot, we are start. We are doing a really good job of that nowadays. Let me just pick up on that trust pilot uh, thing. What did you say you were? Four point six out of five? No, four point three. Four point three. Now I I saw that when I was at your site last week, and I went in and checked on it. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. There's 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 no doubt about that. But the vast majority of the reviews that I read are a variation of, I was unable to charge, and I called customer support to help. And wholly on customer support solved my problem. And they're rating your customer support, not your network. Now, is it really an accomplishment if you're actually saying our reliability is so bad that we need the best customer service to deal with it? No, because um, what I'd absolutely say is our reliability isn't, isn't bad. Our reliability, as I mentioned, it, it is in the high 90%. So um, that's how that our charges are working. Now, calls coming into the call center. Now, this isn't going to be a huge majority, but you get a vary of calls that may come through to our call center. And just to, just to add to that call center, we're one of the only charge point operators to have a 24-7, 365 in-house customer care. Now, with that, what I'd say is uh, some of the calls that will come through will be user error not understanding how to use a charger particularly. And again, that does fall on us. We need to make sure that we make our chargers simple and easy to use from there. So I'd say some of those calls will be from that, from there. And some of them may be something down to as little as someone didn't understand where to put the debit card um, on, on the charger. So yes, well, we're getting calls in there. But what I would say is as well, we've turned a lot of people around um, from having a really reliable network in the past 18 months that actually they're, they're doing reviews off off of that as well. I think that's perfectly valid. I mean, I also went out on Twitter and said, for those people who have been using BP Pulse recently, other than the old 50 kilowatt chargers, what's the reliability been like? And, and everybody who responded, responded very positively about that. So I think that's, that's uh, a fair point. But let me just go back and say, uh, what, what was it that caused that reliability drop in the first place? I think there's a number of issues and a, and a couple I will speak to. Um, like I mentioned earlier, being one of the early CPOs out there installing chargers, some of our chargers were very old, legacy network. And at the moment, we're, we're doing um, some amazing work and I would love to take credit, but it's not. We've got a wonderful team of people who are going around um, looking at our, our legacy network, understanding is that charger in use? When's the last time? Because in some cases, it may be that we, we don't own the charger. Um, it may be that it's a particular host or business that own it. So we're working, working with those to not just get those charges working, but upgrade them. Um, and we, we'll give you an example of that in Milton Keynes at the moment, right near the EV center we spoke about earlier. We, we had a lot of seven kilowatt posts that have been in there for maybe 10 years. And look, a, a lot of them were working, but some of them did need an upgrade. And we're not just replacing like for like. We're looking at the air and understanding what, what does this need? And in some cases, we might be taking out three seven kilowatt posts and reinstalling two seven kilowatts and one fifty kilowatt. So we're upgrading our network constantly. And and look, that that comes from having one of the larger networks and one of the older networks. Everyone's going to have to go through this. We're working really hard to do that at the minute. So I think that's massively helping towards our reliability from there. And as I say, we're doing a lot of work with um, customers who we've worked with for a number of years to to upgrade their chargers and, and make sure that when people go to a BP Pulse charger, that they have, they're extremely confident that it's going to work. And um, on those 50 kilowatt units you spoke about earlier, what I'd say is a lot of them we hear is it's still got polar written on it, or it's still got 
charge master written on it. In a lot of cases, it is because that charge has been so reliable, it's always worked. We've never needed to go out and, although we want to change the stickers on it, but the, the cars, the charges worked very, very well. So um, we haven't had to go out to it as regularly as others. What's the plan going forward from a hardware point of view? Because obviously we've got the, the charges we just talked about, the 50 kilowatt ones, which I believe were they custom designed for charge master at the time? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we built those charges. So, um, but the 50 kilowatt unit and the, the seven kilowatt unit. So a lot of people refer to it as a lipstick post uh, because it looked like a lipstick. Um, yeah, they, they were all in house. They were built in our Milton Keynes office from there. So we've done that until beginning of this year. Um, we've now moved to a different model now where we're using third party equipment on there. So that's our sort of model moving forward. And. What in terms of the rapids? You've got ABB stuff out there. You've also got the new. Um, I keep calling it the free wire stuff, but it's it's not the battery integrated ones. What what's the split going to be? What what are you going to sort of settle on as your your hardware as choice? Sure. So from a public network of a fifty kilowatt and and then say one fifty north of one fifty three hundred and so on and so forth. So from a fifty kilowatt, the minute we we're installing a lot of tritium chargers. So um, a charger, a, a lot of customers who use different networks we're familiar with. And then from a 150 onwards, we're installing a lot of Alpatronics at the minute. We still have a relationship with ABB and we still work with them. But as I say, a lot of Alpatronics at the moment from there. And then we also, purely from a forecourt perspective, mainly, um, we have our battery integrated unit, um, but we're in a partnership with Volkswagen where we're producing that charger. Let's just move on now to Charge UK. Now, it was noticeable that BP joined, BP Post joined Charge UK. Can you tell us more about why you felt it was important to do that, to work with other charge point operators, given that as an organization, you must have access to places like number 10 independently? What I would say is no matter how big we are or, or how competitive this, this CPO um, network is, we all want the same thing. We want to create a bigger and brighter, and more sustainable future. And I believe we can all do that together. And a lot of people say, well, aren't they competitors? That when I speak to sort of people who perhaps aren't in the industry and we go, look, there's enough room for us all to be here and we want to work with everyone to make things as great as we can be. So we absolutely want to be, be a part of it. Are there specific policy priorities that Charge UK have got that you're aligned with? I think at the moment, especially... We're probably, I'm probably jumping ahead here, but coming to sort of new regulations that, that, that are coming out. We're here to work with everyone else. We need to understand how everyone wants to work and, everyone's, and everyone needs to understand how we all want to work together. So what I'd say is we're very collaborative in, in that way. We don't really come in with an agenda or anything like that. We're, we're here to work with everyone. Final question. How do you reply to the oft-quoted statement that the one reason that BP Pulse are quote-unquote so bad is that they're owned by a fossil fuel company and they're deliberately trying to slow down the adoption of EVs in the country. I mean, it seems outlandish, but three of the bottom four poorly rated networks are owned by oil companies. What's your response to that? I, I wouldn't respond to the comment. What I would say is look at what we are doing. We've just invested a billion pound in the UK infrastructure. That isn't being done just for any reason. That is because we have deep conviction that we're doing the right thing in the EV infrastructure. And that's a huge statement to do there. What I would also say is, you mentioned there about network being, quote, bad. Again, what I would say to people is, go and use our network. Go and have a look at it. Because what I promise you is, yes, we've absolutely had our issues in the past. But like you said there, you, you, you put on Twitter saying, is it, what's the reliability been like? And people come back and went, yeah, it, it, it's been great. Now, we've got to continue to um, bring people back and continue to showcase our great work. But look, we, we are fully committed to net zero and, and being there and our, our sort of our, the, the other company we're involved with what we're, what we're talking about um, they fully back us along with many other growth engines um, along the way you know we're he BP are heavily investing in wind um, biofuels hydrogen so we're all in we have deep conviction that that um, EV is is the mode of transport for cars and, and 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 trucks as well we have a business in Germany that we've got EV truck charging and we're looking at that in the UK as well. So what I'd say is don't, before you make comments like that, have a look what we are doing, because I think we're doing, doing a lot and we're doing a lot well. Daniel McLaren, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. A couple of takeaways from this discussion. The reputation for unreliability is one they've made great strides in trying to solve. 
a legacy network of unreliable 50 kilowatt chargers and some legacy units with third-party maintenance contracts thrown in had left them with a bit of a mountain to climb. Uh, they're moving away from the old model of a single charge around the back of a pub or hotel in favor of multiple chargers in either filling stations or customer hubs. If you follow me on social media, you'll know I visited their Gatwick hub with its mix of 50 kilowatt and 150 kilowatt Alcatronic chargers. There's also the recently opened Kettering hub and the announced NEC hub in Birmingham. They're also in a pretty good place when it comes to motorway charging. A BP have a presence of quite a few of the existing MSAs and they can add rapid charges at these locations as they wish. The question which still needs to be answered is whether this will be sufficient or whether adding additional units in the main section of the MSA rather than at the service station is the right choice for BP Pulse. Uh, many thanks to Dan for his time. Hopefully he'll come back in a couple of seasons' time and give us an update on things. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. A team of 35 students from the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands has created a zero-emission mobility vehicle, a fully electric battery-powered EV that captures carbon dioxide as it drives. The students were tasked with creating a zero-emission car, but they took it a step further, developing a unique filter that can capture carbon, cleaning the air as it moves. According to team estimates, the ZEM uses two filters that can capture up to two kilograms of CO2 as the EV travels 20,000 miles. Although this may not seem like much, around 10 ZEMs can absorb as much carbon as an average tree. It's really still proof of concept, but the students are hoping that their new carbon capturing EV will spark a new trend in the industry. As they say, we want to tickle the industry by showing what's already possible. If 35 students can design, develop and build an almost carbon neutral car in a year, then there are also opportunities and possibilities for the industry. Great work from the students. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV driver search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using ZapMap in car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've gone electric. Is available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've gone renewable. It is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musing TV with the words, I can feel a faint pulse, hashtag if you know you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon, you know he's diversifying his hobbies. As he can now do stunts and things balancing on his electric unicycle, he's decided to join the circus and try the old high wire act. I asked him if it's dangerous and he seemed quite nonchalant about it. So I asked him what the most important aspect of walking the high wire was. He told me, um, I think you've done a very good job of answering it there. It's, it's the balance, isn't it? Thanks for listening. Bye.